one of the cornerstones of federal Indian policy, these, these promises that go into perpetuity that run from the United States to the Indian tribes. And the other important component is tribal sovereignty. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Native Minnesota, a podcast about the Native American experience in Minnesota and beyond. My name is Rebecca Crook Stratton, and I'm the host of this podcast. Thanks for joining me today. We have a great show lined up for you. But before I introduce my guest, let me tell you a little bit about this series. This podcast is a project of Understand Native Minnesota, an educational and philanthropic campaign to improve the narrative about Native Americans in Minnesota's public schools. I serve as the secretary treasurer of my tribe, the Shakopee Midwakton Sioux community, and my tribe launched this campaign to work with educators and organizations across the state to bring greater public awareness and accurate understanding about Native Americans in their communities. All right. Okay. Well, Tad, thank you so much for joining us for Native Minnesota, our new podcast that uh, highlights and shares stories about what's going on in Indian country here in Minnesota and beyond. Uh, we're grateful to have you as a guest, uh, one of our first guests. Uh, today, we're, we're going to talk about really whatever comes up. It should just be a, a fun conversation um, and a little back and forth. Uh, you have so much experience, so we could probably chat for hours, but we'll try to limit it here to an hour or so. Um, so yeah, Tad Johnson, a Boys Fort Band of Chippewa member, uh, and among other things, he is a Senior Director of American Indian Tribal Nations Relations at the University of Minnesota, and also the Director of the Tribal Sovereignty Institute at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, and also instrumental in starting the Master's in Tribal Administration program, among other pro programs at the University of Minnesota Duluth. So welcome, Tad. We're super excited to have you here today. I know Thanks, there Rebecca. were a lot I'm of other I know there are a lot of other titles Happy I'm probably missing. Well, I think you did fine. That's probably enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I'm I'm very happy to be with you and, and honored to be one of your first guests on your on your podcast. And I'm looking forward to chatting, as always. Thanks. Well, let's just kick it off with maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, where you grew up, uh, maybe some of the the early things that set you on the the path that you're on today. Sure. Actually, um, right now today, I'm, I'm on Burnside Lake in Ely, Minnesota, and, and this is actually the bay where my mother grew up. Um, and I grew up in Duluth, um, my, but my parents were both from here, from Ely, and I'm right on the edge of the Boundary Waters um, on Burnside Lake. And my grandmother was born um, on this lake where there's a, a river that flows uh, out called the Dead River, and she was born at the intersection of Burnside Lake and Dead River, and the midwife that delivered her had a little boy uh, along with her who ended up uh, being four or five years older than the baby that was born, which was my grandmother, and that ended up being my grandfather. So um, I go back several generations on this lake, but um, my parents both moved to Duluth, uh, but I consider this my second home. I grew up here. My parents would drop me off here in June. I'd stay with um, my cousins and my grandmother. And um, so uh, now I, I've never spent the winter here before, but because you know, one um, benefit of COVID, uh, if there is any such thing, is I got to spend the winter here, which I always wanted to do. <laughs> So I just was out walking on the ice with my dog today. But uh, Duluth was my home. I grew up, um, my mother was a member of the Boys Fort Band. My dad was Scandinavian. Um, I uh, uh, had a very nice childhood. Um, and every summer came up here to the Boundary Waters, which was like paradise and still is. So um, now I'm... Um, um, I probably will retire here, and uh, I have fairly deep roots in this part of Minnesota. Yeah. Thank you. I think, yeah, that connection to land and I was wanting to come back home is something I think we can all relate to. Um, so was there anything particular when you were growing up that 
that put you on the path to want to be a, a lawyer, to, to get involved with tribes and tribal sovereignty? Um, anything particular that you can point to? Well, my mom was always very proud of her her heritage. And anytime there was somebody on TV that was a famous Native American, whether it was when Burt Reynolds first came on and played the blacksmith on, on Gunsmoke, um, my mom pointed out that guy is a is a member of an Indian tribe or, um, you know, various other. She always I remember any time there was a movie on with that featured a real American Indian like Will Rogers, um, my mom would, um, you know, help me tune in and watch it. And she said, this guy is, you know, was like a national treasure and very proud of his American Indian heritage. And so uh, unlike a lot of other folks, um, uh, she was very proud of, of her heritage. She ended up uh, she graduated like third in her high school class and then went on to Haskell, uh, did some time at the University of Minnesota, um, and probably today would have gone on to be uh, a lawyer or a doctor or something. But um, uh, for a woman in the 1940s, um, she she was a really good writer. So um, she became what we used to call a secretary, what we now call an admin assistant, but was always indispensable. And every time she'd leave a job, you know, the the boss would always say to, to me if I'd walk in and visit, and, you know, your mom is totally indispensable to this organization. So so anyway, uh, when, when it was time for my brother and sister and me to go to college, my mom wanted to make sure that we got all the scholarship money. And during the uh, 70s, especially, there was uh, there were a lot of grants for folks to go to college. And so my mom was like, you're going to college and beyond college. And so um, falling into Indian affairs just kind of came naturally um, uh, as uh, I was in law school. They started something called the Minnesota Justice Foundation. And um, one of the summer uh, clerkships was with a guy named Larry Leventhal, who was one of the few people in Minneapolis. I went to the University of Minnesota Law School, and Larry was doing uh, federal Indian law, and, and not too many people were doing it outside of the solicitor's office at the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And so uh, Larry was in the midst of suing um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development on behalf of the Little Earth Housing Project. So I clerked on that case, and then I clerked on another thing he did. And then a couple of his lawyers left while I was there. So I got, while I was in law school, got handed a lot of attorney work that uh, probably was over my head, but uh, it was kind of like I had to learn how to sink or swim. So. Uh, I ended up learning a lot from from Larry. It wasn't the best place to learn how to be a lawyer because, uh, like me, Larry was fairly disorganized. And my one gift uh, is he would say, I need this pleading from this case. And his pleadings were scattered all over his office. And I was always able to go find it. Um, and so um, I learned a lot. I mean, I went to federal court with him, uh, watched him argue and um, uh Anyway, I just thought he was doing was really cool. But um, when I finished law school, I thought I really I had all these grants uh, because I was a member of an Indian tribe. And I went to the Volunteers in Service to America, to the old federal building in downtown Minneapolis. And I said, send me somewhere in America to an Indian reservation. I don't care where. And I was single and I didn't have any debts. And my parents thought I was nuts because they were like, you have a license to steal and you're you're volunteering. And I said, well, I owe something to, to Indian people, I think. And part of that was probably the guilt of being raised Catholic. But, but anyway, I thought they'd send me out west. I pictured myself in New Mexico or Arizona or Alaska. And they sent me 100 miles away to the Mille Lacs Reservation, which at the time was very poor. And... Um, People would ask me, you know, what are you going to do when you're done uh, with your one year VISTA commitment? And I said, I, I don't know, maybe I'll get a job in a bank or something. But the it never ended. I still <laughs> I still advise the Mille Lacs band to this day. Um, and it ended up totally changing my life. And I uh, without thinking about law school that much or what, you know, what I was going to do with that, I realized when I got there, these guys actually need a lawyer. 
And so I had, I had to rise to the occasion and actually become a real lawyer because when you get there, they fully expect you to understand all their treaties, you know, the OMB circulars, the, you know, all the, all the stuff that a reservation does every day. And I didn't, I had to walk down the hallway and talk to people that had been there a long time. So, so I got caught up in their cause and I, you know, just fell in love with the work and, and I learned that the, you know, that feeling doesn't go away, um, that, that, you know, giving back was something that was, that was pretty important to me. And it, it, it just, uh, uh, it never ended. Um, you, you, you know, once you get this idea that actually Indian country needs me as, you know, as, as meager as my skills are compared to a lot of the other lawyers I've met in my career, um, at that moment in history, Malax Malax needed a lawyer. So that's, what I had to become. That's, I think that's really common across Indian country is we feel, uh, you know, no matter where, what tribe you come from, you feel a need to give back to your communities. Um, and people sometimes go back to their own communities and sometimes work for broader Indian country, but there's so much work to be done. Um, I think that that sense of obligation is a good sense of obligation and and sets people on a, a path many times. So I know I can relate to that for sure. Yeah. Um, was, when you were at was, Malak, was it, was Marge Anders, Anderson chair? Well, when I first got there, uh, there was a gentleman named Arthur Gabo, yeah. who was the chairman. Yeah. And Art was very good friends with Roger Jordan and Wendell Chino and Joe Delacruz. And, um, at first, he thought he was like, "Why would a guy with an attorney's license want to come and to live on a reservation?" And he was like, "At first, he thought I was an FBI agent." And he was like, "He told a few people, who is this guy?'" And then he uh, learned I was related to a bunch of people that he knew at Boys Fort, and so suddenly I was okay. And um, but Art talked um, the, the the way my grandmother talked and it just reminded me so much of uh people whose first language is Ojibwe and I don't know if this is true of Dakota but when I would talk to my grandmother it would be like I mean it's it's like listening to somebody um you know if you ask her a question she has to take you on this journey and it's like going around a lake into bays and inlet and she has to tell these little sub stories and characters and other things before she gets to the answer and sometimes it takes a long time to get to the answer and when I first you know when Art decided I was not an FBI agent he called me into his office and talked to me for an hour straight he, he and I was trying to follow it and it was like you know, I was like following him around the lake through the inlet. And then he was telling me about the BIA and the IHS and, and people at the BIA and Wendell Chino and Roger Jordan and the Constitution. And then there was going to be this big meeting. And then at the end of which I was kind of left, what what am I expected to say here? And I said, are you asking me to go to Philadelphia with you? And he said, yeah. <laughs> so um, what it was, it was 1987. And it was the 200th anniversary of the writing of the Constitution. And um, they were doing uh, a, uh, an event at the um, Philadelphia Ethical Society. And um, uh, what had happened was uh, the folks from Philadelphia called Roger Jordan up and said, how are you going to celebrate the 200th uh, anniversary of writing the Constitution? And he was like, you know, Roger Jordan had this very gruff voice. And he was like, ah, we don't have anything to celebrate. We're going to, you know. Um, so what he called up Wendell Chino, who was his good friend from Mescalero Apache, and said, let's go out to Philadelphia and actually put on a conference. So they invited a bunch of Indian law scholars and um, a bunch of tribal leaders out there. And since it was the 200th anniversary of the Constitution, they wanted to take a new look at the relationship between the tribes and the United States and the Constitution. And um, anyway, and so the tribal leaders got up and spoke and I got to meet, you know, Chino and Jordan and all these legendary tribal leaders, Joe Delacruz. And, and um, uh, what ended up happening as a result of that was um, they, they started down the road of tribal self-governance. And um, so 
as you know, Rebecca, in 1975, Congress passed the Indian Self-Determination Act. And that was a capacity building act. And so tribes could, if there were, say you had a big reservation like Red Lake and you have seven Bureau of Indian Affairs foresters coming there. And suppose the tribe wants to take over two of those positions because the United States owes a trust responsibility to the tribes. Um, the United States would have to pay contracts um, and, and vehicle uh, funding and all that to one of the tribal members and make sure that they got, you know, the equivalent of the pay and benefits that the Bureau would have provided because, because of the big real estate transaction in the 19th century, the United States promised uh, certain things to tribes. Among those, we're gonna take care and make sure your forest is productive. So, but under the Self-Determination Act of 75, uh, the tribe could say, okay, we want to take over two of those forestry positions, for example, or three or four or whatever, and they would enter into self-determination contracts. Well, by the late 80s, when, when we were meeting, um, that had still become, um, it was still capacity building, but tribes and a lot of tribes had moved beyond that. And they wanted to go to the next level, which was getting the funding in a big block grant and um, um, being able to to prioritize the funding themselves. And this was the idea behind the self-governance movement, which got kind of started at this meeting in Philadelphia. And this group of leaders was called the Alliance of American Indian Leaders. And it included a whole bunch of, of notables. I think the only one today who's still alive is Ron Allen. Um, but but anyway, they, they went to Sid Yates, who at the time was the chairman of the House Subcommittee on interior and related agencies, a position that Betty McCollum from Minnesota holds today. And they told Sid Yates, and Sid Yates had two soft spots. One was for the arts and one was for Indians. And in, in this year, in 1987, in that year, all these articles had been written in the Arizona Republic about how few dollars that got appropriated for Indian tribes actually got to the Indian tribes. A lot of that got eaten up by the bureaucracy in the Bureau of Indian Affairs or the Indian Health Service or HUD or whatever agency it was going through. And so the tribes brought those articles to the attention of, of Congressman Yates. And he said, if you, if you, you know, folks can think of another way of doing this, I want to hear about it. So he established the self-governance demonstration project. And that got written into um, the Self-Determination Act. And so um, these tribes decided that they would they would try this. That and the bureau uh, went along with it, and Congress went along with the demonstration project, which became Title III of uh, the, the Indian Self Determination Act. That twenty tribes could take their money in a block grant, reprioritize it, and recreate programs if they wanted to. And so the very first compact was done with Mille Lacs, um, and. I wasn't there to, to do it. Phil Bakershank actually negotiated the compact, but um, but Malax became you know it worked. The the, the demonstration project worked. Um, meanwhile, I I went on this whole other journey to Washington, but I should <laughs> I should let you chat for a while. No, and and I think that that story kind of leads up to you spent a lot of time in Washington working on behalf of tribes and. Uh, Native American initiatives. So was that trip like the first kind of you got your foot in the door in DC and really enjoyed what you saw and what you got stuck yeah. there for a while? Yeah, <laughs> that that trip to Philadelphia you know, kind of changed my life. It was um, uh, it was like these were a group of people that were looking at the big historical picture of federal Indian policy and saying it's time it's time for a change. And they, you know, like everything else I've discovered in Indian country, um, in spite of the fact that was a, that did become a huge change, it didn't, it wasn't the big change they were looking for. It was like, it was like a, an incremental step to what, what came next. But yeah, I got caught up and um, as a VISTA volunteer, I would go to like the Minnesota uh, legislative dinner and uh the band started pushing me into the state attorney general, who at the time was Skip Humphrey. And 
what was happening was the state of Minnesota used to require tribes when they entered into a contract with the state to waive its sovereign immunity. Um, so um, basically, um, the state can't be sued without its consent. The United States can't be sued without its consent. Tribes cannot be sued without their consent. But in order to enter into a contract with the state at the time, and frequently these were federal flow through dollars. So there were, there were dollars that were supposed to go to tribes, but in order to get the dollars, the tribes had to waive their sovereign immunity. In other words, the, the way the Mille Lacs ban saw it is they were denying their sovereign status in order to get state monies. And so we ended up, my first thing was they pushed me in front of, in front of Skip Humphrey and I explained this problem to him. And then um, the next thing I knew, we talked to our state legislators and they actually introduced a bill. And I kind of enjoyed the legislative process of, of uh, getting this through and, you know, um, and what, it's still on the books today that um, the the um, the state, as a prerequisite of entering into a contract with a tribe, cannot require them to deny their sovereign status. Or in other words, they can't be required to, to waive their sovereign immunity to enter into a contract with the state of Minnesota. And that was the very first thing I worked on. But then, yeah, they sent me out as a boy lawyer to um, to Washington, and I was watching all these um, very skilled attorneys drafting up the language for the self-governance demonstration project. And I had a very vague idea of what was going on. I, and little did I know that, you know, a couple of years later, I would be one of the guys they'd be lobbying. But um, at the time, I just kept going back to Washington to as this as this uh, demonstration project worked its way through the House and the Senate. And I kind of caught on and I kept meeting up with a friend of mine who had gone to Georgetown Law School and he, and I was single at the time and, and he asked me, you know, have you ever thought of working on Capitol Hill? And I said, no, I never have. So he introduced me to Eric Eberhardt, who was actually uh, John McCain's guy. And uh, we talked for like an hour and a half about, you know, what, what we were doing on the reservation and about um, how we were pushing the legislation on self-governance, which he, he knew all about because he was writing uh, the legislation on the Senate side. So anyway, we just kind of hit it off. And then he said, well, we're not hiring right now on the Senate side, but uh, this was, you know, incredibly fortuitous. He said, um, Mo Udall, who is like a legendary figure on Capitol Hill, is looking for a deputy counsel on Indian affairs. So he sent my resume over and then um, my phone rings about a week later and it's Frank Ducino, another legendary figure in Indian affairs. And he said, um, how would you like to come out and interview for a position with us? And uh, he said, you're going to have to figure out how to get out of here yourself. And I said, OK, well, I, I come out every once in a while. So I went out and um, um, and they I don't know why they picked me, but um, the one of the main things they were interested in was um, uh, whether or not I seemed like a nice guy. I was trying to demonstrate my incredible knowledge of federal Indian law, but they were looking like for a good fit to their office. And, you know, I asked them later, how did you pick me? And they said, well, we thought you'd fit in nicely because uh, um, uh, Frank's this very strong personality and we have this very strong personality out here and you you seem like you're a very nice person. So I was like, oh, I, I thought it was because of my, my tremendous... Uh, uh, acumen and and uh, brilliance on federal Indian law, and they said, "No, no, we we thought you were good on that too." But but uh, but anyway, um, so I spent uh, ten months with Frank and learned the ins and outs of how Congress worked, and it was probably as good a graduate school I could have gone to, uh, you know, because Frank Ducheneau had been around Capitol Hill through. I mean, he was there when um, they they turned around the termination policy. So they restored um, the Menominee tribe. And he said he and uh, Frank, and, and a lot of people forget these names, but I hope they remember them. Frank Ducheneau is still alive. He's 81. He lives on a mountain in Montana. Forrest Gerard uh, passed away a few years ago, but Frank worked for Mo Udall and Forrest worked for Scoop Jackson, who was a terminationist. And then uh, Forrest ended up turning him around. And then Udall and Jackson, 
uh, and other others who they you know managed to talk into it ended up passing all these you know legendary acts from the 70s the the you know reversing termination by by restoring the Menominee tribe and then restoring other tribes and then the Indian self Termination Act and the American Indian Religious Freedom Act and the Indian Child Welfare Act. And I mean, these guys were, you know, the movers and shakers. And then they had like the National Congress of American Indians behind them. So at one point, Vine Deloria was the executive director and then Chuck Trimble and a lot of other legendary figures that, you know, are now, um, you know, uh, some are still with us. Some are, are have, have walked on, but, but, um, um, I mean, everybody seems to know a lot of the names of the folks in the American Indian movement. But to me, these quiet people out in Washington, sometimes not so quiet, um, uh, made all these changes in the law. And, you know, uh, people were arguing cases, you know, somebody argued Martin versus Mancarry, which which allows for um, uh you know, it essentially said that being an Indian is not a racial classification, it's a political classification. So that was 1974. So that was defending the Indian Reorganization Act, which allowed for Indian preference hiring in the Bureau of Indian Affairs and, and Indian Health Service. So there was all this activism going on in the 70s. I was in college and during that time and then in the 80s I was in law school and finding my way out there by by the time I got to DC in 90 and I started working for Frank and Udall they were just, just wrapping up the um, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act and what they had discovered when they were about to build the National Museum of the American Indian was in the basement of the Smithsonian where about 34,000 uh, human remains of American Indians along with funerary objects and objects of cultural patrimony. So I got to watch that bill get written by the master, by Frank, and um, uh, other important acts passed that year, but it was Udall's last year in Congress because he he had Alzheimer, uh, not Alzheimer, he had Parkinson's disease. And then he fell down some steps very tragically and had to resign. And then Frank retired and I was left there, you know, I was like, I kept the next guy who came in was George Miller from California. And um, um, it was, a, you know, I had just gotten married and I told Emily, we might have to move back to Minnesota because I, I don't know if I have a job because, you know, and Miller's staff didn't get along very well. Um, so I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but. Thinking, thinking of all the things that happened over that time period and, you know, all the advisors that were out there that were Native American working on behalf of tribes, but we didn't really see elected officials that were Native American. Um, you know, fast forward to today where, you know, there you were still able to accomplish so many things on behalf of tribes advising um, you know, the elected officials that are in charge. And then now, you know, we see uh, Deb Holland and Sharice Davids and um, those those folks, uh, Tom Cole, and we have Native Americans now um, on, on peer level uh, with other elected leaders um, helping to move the needle now. Do you think that makes a, a big difference uh, going from oh, yeah. rising capacity to actual elected leadership? Yeah, um, I I don't you know we we didn't we you know sometime I would imagine when we were young staffers about you know maybe someday you know there'll be more of us in Congress or maybe even you know in the cabinet but um, yeah I I can almost not talk about I mean uh, I get very emotional when I think about Deb Howell it's a, it's such a step forward for for Indian people for 171 years that agency sat there and there had never been um a native american face in the cabinet room um uh, you know, sitting at the table, participating as an equal with the other members of the cabinet. And that's that's happening today. And I mean, um, I was on the committee and Ben Nighthors Campbell was he was a Democrat on the House side at that point. And I was, you know, and every he, you know, uh, I don't think he minded every every tribe in the country would go visit him when he was on the House side. Um, uh, but he was, you know, 
Um, he wasn't the first American Indian in Congress, but I mean, he was uh, he was definitely an important figure. There had been a, a guy named Ben Rifle from South Dakota who was a Republican and, and a Native American. And there had been other people over the years. But I mean, uh, today we've got uh, I mean, when I look at our lieutenant governor, our state legislature, Congress, now the Interior Department, both the the. Um, uh, uh, the the secretary and the solicitor are Native Americans, and uh, the solicitor is actually from Boys Fort. He's my first cousin, um, and he's he's about a hundred yards that way in another cabin. So we're we're neighbors. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm very proud of of where Indian Country has gone over the last several years. But uh, but we would um, we would work across the aisle quite a bit back then, and because. The, before gaming got really big, um, the issues we were working on were real bread and butter issues. So we were in 92, we were reauthorizing the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. And we, we dropped a bill out in and Steve Healy was my counsel. He later became McCain's staff director. And Steve's a Canadian Indian, so he could switch parties pretty easily. But um, I, he had worked for McCain and then he came over and became, I was staff director of the subcommittee on Native American Affairs and he became the counsel. And so uh, really a bright guy went to Dartmouth and law school at Berkeley. And I, I was surrounded by people who had gone to Ivy League schools. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, uh, another lawyer went to uh, did his undergrad at Williams and went to law school at Cornell. And uh, anyway, I, I always try to surround myself with people that are a lot smarter than I am. So and I was lucky enough to be the staff director of a subcommittee with Marie Howard, whose father was a congressman and knew everything about Capitol Hill. And so um, anyway, I uh, I got to work with these folks and during that period of time in 93 and 94, it was like right now, uh, only there was a much bigger gap. Um, the, the, the Democrats had clear control of the House and, and pretty good control of the Senate, and Clinton was in the White House. And during those two years, he didn't veto any bills. So we got through uh, permanent self-governance. Um, so it had been a demonstration project up until then. And we also got... Um, a whole bunch of other things through uh, during that period, and I, I look back at the bills that got passed, and it would be it would be hard to pass a lot of them these days. Um, it was the beginning of Indian gaming, and it was um, it was quite quite new. And Donald Trump actually came up and testified in front of our committee in '93, and it was the famous testimony where he was complaining about the Mashantucket Pequots and said. They don't look like Indians to him, and they don't look like Indians to Indians. And then uh, he got chewed out. Um, uh, George Miller, who became the chairman of the committee after Udall, is this gigantic man with this gigantic voice. And um, he was not afraid of anybody. And he was uh, really, um, really went after Trump for his very bigoted remarks. And so did uh, there's a, a a tape from uh, the Washington Post. You can still go 1993 Indians Trump um, and uh, get the uh, watch the videotape of Bill Richardson, Neil Abercrombie and George Miller all chewing out uh, Donald Trump, who's saying that Indian gaming is going to be the biggest scandal since Al Capone. And, um, we, you know, we we kept questioning, we kept bringing the FBI, the Justice Department, the National Indian Gaming Commission up to see if, you know, if there was anything uh, untoward going on. And uh, Tony Hope, who was the first chairman of the National Indian Gaming Commission, said, "There, we, you know, we haven't found, there's been like two instances of organized crime and both times the tribes turn the, 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 you know, the organized crime people in. He said, but what we, what we do have on reservations is disorganized tribes where you might get a pit boss working with a dealer, but they'll frequently get caught because of the internal control standards that the tribes had put in place. So anyway, it was it was quite an adventure um, 
doing all that and being there on Capitol Hill during that time. And because the issues were so basic, they were gaming and that got that big. It was just getting off the ground. And this was the early 90s. And states, I remember Fife Symington from Arizona said, we're never going to negotiate compacts with tribes. And the governor of Michigan said the same thing. And one by one, we watched the governors fall off as they negotiated agreements with tribes. And so um, anyway, but everybody was complaining about the fact that it was unregulated. Well, that it wasn't true. And the tribes got better at regulating it because the tribes have such a big interest in making sure that um, a dime that's supposed to stay on the reservation stays on the reservation. So um, they had every impetus and every every inclination to make sure that their casinos were well regulated. But it took a long time for Congress to figure that out and um, and the critics of Indian gaming. So now that's not an issue. That's been taken off the table long, long ago. But that was at the beginning, that was a big problem. People saying it's unregulated. And um, as the industry got bigger, the tribes got better at it. And that was all there was to it. Tribes are modern, thriving governments, and Native Americans make important contributions to our state every day. My tribe's campaign, Understand Native Minnesota, is about ensuring that public school students across the state understand Native history, cultures, and governments. Our campaign recently launched a newsletter to help share timely information about Native issues. Learn more and sign up for this free news digest at understandnativemn.org backslash news. Well, I think Indian gaming too is an example of whether you talk about tribal self-governance also, um, the federal government and states not trusting Indians to be able to handle their own affairs when, you know, fast forward, you look now and Indians that are able to handle their own affairs are in a much better position, um, whether that's, you know, providing services rather than Indian health services or education, um, tribes know what their people need, so they, they do a better job of it. And I think, you know, when it comes to gaming and you talk about regulation, uh, we do do it better than I think a lot of other regulators because it's very, it's a personal thing. Um, like you said, every one of those dollars needs to get back to the tribal government so they can continue to deliver services. So it's in their interest to be highly and well-regulated. Yeah, it was a unique moment um, when Trump was testifying uh, and, and challenging tribal ability to regulate it. What the tribes focused on very wisely, and this was the late Rick Hill, the late Tim Wapato, and Gay Kingman, um, and tribes were learning how to play the Capitol Hill game, um, and they ended up playing it better than Trump did. Trump had um, Robert Torricelli, who was a congressman at the time from New Jersey, later a senator from New Jersey, and he um, uh, that day he testified, Torcelli dropped a bill in which um, uh, Gay and Tim and, and Rick uh, dubbed the Donald Trump Protection Act. And there was a, a Capitol Hill newspaper that all the congressmen read. And what they did was they took out a full page ad and it was um, uh, on, on half of the page was a picture of a bunch of kids running out of Neosheng School at Mille Lacs. And on the other half of the page was a picture of Donald Trump's yacht. And it was kind of like schools versus yachts. And it was like they were making the point that uh, Indian gaming is governmental gaming. We use it for clinics and housing and healthcare and schools. And, and um, um, Donald Trump and other casino holders were, were using it for their own personal wealth and um, um, you know, and and their shareholders made money, but but um, tribes were using it because, to me, gaming was a desperate remedy to a desperate situation. I mean, if you look, I I used to rattle off the stats from Indian country that are not necessarily true anymore from most tribes, but I mean, um, Indian healthcare was only ever really funded about half the need of Indian country, and I, that probably still continues to this day. My tribe, Boys Fort, you know, uses gaming as a supplement. But what people don't realize about gaming in, in outstate Minnesota is, is um, like 70% of outstate Minnesota jobs are somehow um, 
uh, tied in with reservations and, and tribal gaming because um, Indian gaming operations and their hotels are buying everything from propane to milk to you know bread, everything to run a restaurant, everything to run a hotel, and so they're they're actually economic drivers in rural Minnesota. And so, um, yeah, they uh, the industry had to be allowed to grow and like. A lot of other things in America, the opposition to Indian gaming was based on greed. And the, the reason for Indian gaming was based on need. It was, it was, you know, this was an industry that was needed for uh, some very, very poor people living in some very, very poor conditions. So it's not that it's been a panacea for, for Indian country, but it changed. Uh, everything changed uh, during that, that time frame. And um, anyway, I... Uh, I just That's think one of the biggest misconceptions, I think, on uh, with the general public, uh, the reason for Indian gaming. And when you talk about Indian gaming and really the the foundation of it was to provide jobs for people in rural areas, because that's where most reservations are, um, and to to provide revenue for the government to operate. So I, I think, like you said, there's this huge misconception that, you know, casinos make individual Indians rich, but um, I don't think they make anybody rich per se, but they allow tribes to provide services for their people um, and continue to do that today. And those purposes are written right into the act. I mean, it's kind of, it's got to be used for governmental services, economic development. Um, and that's what they did. They, um, now the, a lot of tribes are, are leveraging um, their uh, funding they, they, they made from casinos and getting into, and, and actually um, uh, trying to add on to their economies, getting into other businesses. Um, and so, it was the it was planting a seed of of economic development in Indian country, and now um, tribes are growing in directions that make sense for their geographic regions and for the people that surround them. And um, but it was uh, it was a moment in history when um, the the from I was there in Congress from ninety to ninety five, and there were all these attacks uh, on the gaming industry. And um, tribes had to um, and, and did rise to the occasion. Um, and it was, I, you know, we saw the growth of the National Congress of American Indians and the, the political, um, the new political heft that the tribes had and the National Indian Gaming Association grew during that, that period. And um, it was just a really interesting time to be there. And I, I, I look back on that as my my halcyon days of, of youth, and my wife keeps telling me you were miserable the whole time. Well, I was, I was the staff director. I was a pretty young guy, um, and I was a nervous wreck the whole time I was there because I was like, uh, a lot of things were riding on tribes not losing Indian gaming, tribes you know, finding better ways to govern themselves uh, through self governance, and then doing things like. Um, uh, there was a uh, when I first got there, we did the NAGPRA and we also did um, the tribal uh, timber bill, which kind of um, indicated that uh, that that, you know, the, the timber on reservations taking care of that was a was a federal trust responsibility. And we we wanted to do a, a series of bills where we would enhance the trust responsibility in the United States. And we kind of um, we did it for a lot of things, but um, uh, Congress changed hands in 1995, and so it was the the age of Newt Gingrich began. And um, uh, before, we, in the before we go on a little bit, I want to just yeah. circle back to when we talk about the trust responsibility. Um, I think that's something a lot of people probably don't understand either. Can you talk a little bit about? where that trust responsibility comes from and maybe a little bit about, you know, how it's been used and, and where we are today with that trust responsibility. Sure. Great question. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I usually begin my federal Indian law lectures with two ideas and they're not, they seem to be opposing, but they've seemed to work together. The first is the sovereignty of tribes, the ability to use self-govern. The second is uh, the trust responsibility. And to me, that comes from the big 
real estate transaction of the 19th century. And so imagine Minnesota before reservations. There were, you know, these vast, you know, parcels of land all over Minnesota. And um, with, with, I'll take my example. So the Boys Fort Band, uh, Fond du Lac and Grand Portage occupied the whole Arrowhead region of, of northern Minnesota. That region got seeded, uh, that's the word is C-E-D-E-D, seeded by a uh, uh, treaty of 1854. And so the United States got the right to come onto the, the land after that. And then the Boys Fort Reservation was created by uh, a treaty in 1866. And, um, um, and so as a result of trading the Iron Range and its billions of dollars of, of wealth that later others accumulated through both cutting timber and mining iron ore, um, the Boys Fort Band was relegated to 100,000 acres um, but um, what the Congress promised um, and the treaty promised and later acts of Congress promised was the tribe can control what goes on inside those 100,000 acres and into perpetuity, the United States would provide health care, housing, education. If there was um, there were natural resources inside the boundaries of the reservation, the United States was the trustee of those things. And so the United States has a trust obligation, which is actually like when you put money into a bank, it's like a fiduciary relationship. The bank is supposed to be taking care of your money and making sure it's productive. And there's all these duties that run with a trust responsibility, a duty of productivity, a duty of loyalty. And that's the duty that the United States owes to Indian people on reservations. And later on, uh, a series of acts got passed where the United States made further promises. The Indian Health Care Improvement Act is a classic one. Uh, there are also Indian Education Acts that promised that it's going to be a trust responsibility to provide education to um, people on reservations. And so um, the trust responsibility is like the cornerstone, one of the cornerstones of federal Indian policy, these, these promises that go into perpetuity that run from the United States to the Indian tribes. And the other important component is tribal sovereignty, the ability to govern yourself within your boundaries, to determine your own destiny, to make your own laws and be governed by them. And those are two things that, you know, last forever. And so um, we always had sovereignty. We've had sovereignty from time immemorial. Before we had the type of government, the federal government now recognizes we had the right to govern ourselves, whether it was, you know, by by clans, by, you know, um, by headmen, by um, whoever. But we always, sovereignty is something that goes back. It's inherent. We always had it. We always will have it. And so the trust responsibility is something, uh, there's a great quote from a case called U.S. versus Winans, which is that um, a treaty is, is not a, a promise derived, uh, it's not a promise to tribes, but a promise that comes from tribes. And so the tribes are, are allowing um, people to do things under the treaty. And it, the tribes have the right first and then the treaties would allow other people to do other things. So it's not a grant of right to tribes, but a grant of right from tribes. And so that's what a lot of people forget. My, my uh, colleague, Joseph Bauerkemper, gives a great lecture on his rights that he gained as a white guy under the 1854 treaty. He said, I couldn't be here in Duluth if, if the tribes had not agreed to the 1854 treaty. So, um, so yeah, we we look at uh, the trust responsibility. It derives from treaties, and there were around close to 400 treaties that got ratified by the Senate. So they were negotiated by the executive branch, ratified by a two-thirds majority of the Senate, and promises were made there. And then later on, statutes, um, education statutes, healthcare statutes, housing statutes, made promises to tribes 
And then the course of dealing, regulations, um, you know, the BIA providing certain services to tribes, which became indicative of a pro underlying promise. And so those responsibilities are continuous and continue to flow to Indian reservations. And so the trust responsibility, yeah, is, is a cornerstone of, of, um, uh, of the United States' ongoing and, and continuing responsibility to tribes. I mean, all these other agencies are peripheral and they're important, parks, public lands, mining, um, Bureau of Land Management. But um, when it comes to the people that the Interior Department <laughs> is impacting, it's us, Indian people, and that trust responsibility that Deb Howland is now in charge of um, uh, um that large part in large part comes from interior also flows from other federal agencies and the way senator onoe and president obama looked at it is that responsibility flows not only from interior but from every federal agency so when obama first met with the tribes he said i want to figure out the best way to consult with you and so every agency no matter how remote from tribes and i'm guessing biden will take the same approach so I remember going to meetings with the State Department and banking regulators and all kinds of, of entities that suddenly had to come up with tribal consultation policies. And the good thing is that caught on with Governor Dayton and now Governor Walls, partly because of our lieutenant governor. But I mean, Walls expanded that consultation policy to all state agencies. So that consultation policy became so important during the Obama years, and now it's risen, or it's it's kind of come down to the state uh, and the profession of tribal liaison actually becoming a very important profession in the state of Minnesota. And a lot of our MTAG grads um, have gone into being tribal liaisons and now um, federal liaisons. So um, anyway, I'm very proud yeah, of, of the, our grads. The MTAG program and the Masters of Tribal Administration, uh, which I'm a graduate of also, um, you were instrumental in starting that program. Um, I know we're kind of fast forwarding from your DC days back to Minnesota, but um, I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, what really started that process to work with the University of Minnesota to create these programs that really created a, an academic discipline uh, for tribal people to to study and learn and then be able to take that knowledge back to the reservation. Well, after being gone from, for 10 years from Mille Lacs, I returned to Mille Lacs and for 10 years, I ran their government affairs shop and I, I was their general counsel four times along the way. Every time the general counsel would quit, I would come in and do it. So, um, but uh, during that time, we we did the, I oversaw the lobbying and the PR work that, that was done by the great firm of Goff Public. Um, and, and I love that job, but it was kind of like, I actually remember coming to work one day and saying these very stupid words, gosh, this job almost seems too easy. And so, uh, I had a friend of mine who was at UMD and said, uh, and I started holding meetings because I went up there and I said, well, I know why you guys invited me up. Um, you eventually want Mille Lacs to donate money, but what Mille Lacs is going to ask me because I screen all the donations is what is UMD doing for us? And they, they said, well, what do you think we should be doing? And I named off a whole bunch of things, all of which had to do with gaming. And then I said, also, there is no place to learn how to run a reservation. The only way you can learn how to run a reservation is, is the, the way I did, which is walking down the hallway and talking to the, the lady who's been in accounting for the last 30 years or the guy who's been running the natural resources department for the last 25 years. And I said... When I went to law school, they gave me this outline of things I might run into in a 25 or 40 year law career, you know, constitutional law, evidence, contracts, et cetera. And I said, there's no place to get that little, you know, um, bit of education that will help you as a tribal administrator. And they said, we, we like that. <laughs> could you could you put on a couple of meetings? So I. By then, I, I was 52, and I knew all the tribal administrators in Minnesota, so I, I brought them all in and held a meeting and said, okay, if we started a master's program, what would you guys need to know? And 
a few things kept rising to the top. Everybody, whether they were the, they answered the phones or they were the tribal chairman said, human resources issues always land on my desk. Everybody, everybody hates personnel issues. So they all, that's the number one thing. And then they're like, well, courses and leadership would be important. And then, you know, and then after they thought, we, we, we did two years of meetings on this. And I said, the only way to develop this program is to meet with tribes and find out what they, and that, I learned that from Congress and later my, my stint with the National Indian Gaming Commission. The best ideas always come from the tribes because, I mean, they, they are living it day to day. And it was kind of like, okay, we could, we could use courses on the big picture of federal Indian policy. So we created principles of tribal sovereignty, which takes people from Columbus to the modern day of self-determination in Indian gaming. Uh, two semesters of that. Federal Indian law, they wanted to know that. So with a year-long course in that. Tribal finance, accounting, and budgets. I was executive director of Boys Fort for a while. And I, I was a lawyer, so I had the accountant in my office all the time. And my, I kept, you know, can we afford this? Can we afford that? Can we afford this? Well, if we do this, we can't afford this. And then I found out every question to me. I mean, I knew the law stuff. It was the accounting stuff. It was like, you know, it was constantly balancing the books. You know, well, if you want to do that, we can. We, we, so um, we, I brought in the... Um, the CPA MBA who ran the accounting department for my tribe at Boys Fort. And, um, and so she taught tribal finance, accounting, budget, and, and still does. And then um, I went to the business school and I wanted to find out, you know, if you're managing um, a uh, anything, what, what are the management type courses? And then I, uh, they said, you know, strategic management, operations management, human resources management, and, project management. So I went and tried those out and, and explained them to tribes. And they were like, yeah, we need that. And so those four management um, uh, courses worked their way into the curriculum. And then there was one directed project. And um, after a while, you know, we started, I started hearing the same things in the consultations over and over and over again, and figured we were on to and leadership and ethics um, was, was also rose to the top because it was always, you know, they frequently found their leadership to be unethical or somebody had a problem with, you know, somebody leading this department hires their nephew and, you know, how do we deal with that? So, so that's how the program got put together. And um, what I ended up doing was uh, um, I ended up taking, I, I, I didn't know anything about UMD or, or the university, but they and what they did with me is almost unheard of. Um, I sort of parachuted in as a full professor with tenure, and they made me the head of the Department of American Indian Studies, which never happens and probably will never happen again. But they, um, um, what UMD was hurting in was um, the way they make sure that majors stay around and they don't get merged with another department is. Um, they want to make sure that you have enough people majoring in your subject matter. And um, after two years of consultation, we, we had about, you know, f under 10 American Indian Studies majors um, at UMD. And then when we started MTAG, um, everybody was like, well, you're a nice, nice work kid. You're going to get you know, maybe three or four if you're lucky in the first year. We ended up having 30 applicants to the first um, MTAG cohort. And then we had 27 in the second MTAG cohort. And so the cohort took off and suddenly everybody who had been sort of chuckling about this guy who just parachuted in from the reservation was like, oh, maybe this guy actually knows what he's doing. So so MTAG kind of took off and, you know, it's and it's continued to have between 13 and 15 people out, we're averaging that um, a year. And we have, you know, secretary treasurers, chairs. And since it's online and it's been going more online, I think when, when you were there, we had more people showing up for class, but um, especially during the time of COVID, we've changed it now to a totally online program. So, um, but we've had people from upstate New York, people from California, Washington state, there's a tribal leader in Utah that went through the program and a lot of executive directors, including yours and, and numerous others at 
one at Leech Lake. They're all over the place. So, yeah, I'm very proud of where folks have gone. A lot of them are tribal liaisons. And, and uh, so then we went down to a bachelor's degree. Um, but we discovered um, the, the niche of 18 to 22 year olds. Like I sent my kid to Morris, which is a great school, um, but, but they have tuition uh, waivers. And we don't have that at UMD. And undergrads that want, you know, they, they would prefer to go to the Twin Cities campus because it's very cool to go to the Twin Cities campus. But we weren't attracting the 18 to 22 year olds. We do attract pe mid-career people. And so that's kind of what kept our department alive was um, graduate programs. So we created a bachelor's program, um, which I wanted to call BTAG, but we just we ended up calling TAG because we um, Anyway, and we've had a lot of folks come and major in that. Now we've got around 15 people in that program each year. And, and then tribes came to us later and said, well, we've done this great job on administration. What about um, natural resources? And so we spent three years working with uh, the School of Science, developing a Master of Tribal Resource and Environmental Stewardship, which is pretty much um, when foresters or managers of timber companies look at a forest, they want to figure out how many trees can I cut and there'll still be a forest there next year. When tribes look at a forest, they, they said, don't call it management because we don't manage it. We, we're stewards. Call it stewardship because we look at the forest and make sure that the forest is going to be there in seven generations and all the things that happen when timbering timber companies come in uh, and there are little critters like martins and fishers that, you know, live uh, under the, the fallen trees, the trees that fall naturally during storms and blowdowns and things like that. There's this whole group of, of um, animals that live in, you know, ancient forests that don't live in, in forests that are cut on a regular basis. So when tribes look at, at forests and nature and water and everything, they, they look at it completely differently. So we managed to merge Western science with traditional ecological knowledge and started that program a few years back. And that one's still catching wind. Um, and then I, I, um, I've noticed that there's other programs around and I think we need to focus more of our efforts in that program on, on global, on climate change. Um, because in looking what's going on in the world, the indigenous peoples of, of the world are among the first impacted by, by climate change. And I think that is, and I think we can learn a lot of lessons. And one, one thing that editorialists are noting about Deb Hallin's appointment is that, you know, the people that were against her were against her environmental views. Uh, the people that were for her are, you know, first of all, there's us as Native Americans wanting her there because because of, you know, that's that's the agency that has a lot to do with our lives. But also, I mean, she has this worldview, unlike anybody else who's ever sat in that interior department chair. Um, and she views, you know, um, uh, the environment, nature, Mother Earth differently than any other any other person has ever sat there and so i think that perspective is going to become more important as the years go by and i i'm a strong believer in this program which you know is taking a while to catch on but i think we need to we need to create a bunch of global climate warriors um and and uh really be the stewards for the planet and that's that's what we need to start cranking out I agree. I think people are really going to see uh, Secretary Holland's leadership and the way she approaches environmental issues. And, and hopefully it catches on and it's more a, a value-based way to uh, look at the environment. And I really hope people will come to appreciate and see the value in, in how she views the environment and, and help hopefully protects it too. Um, but but yeah, so there's the MTAG program, the Masters in Tribal Administration, and then you've got the, the Resource Management and Stewardship program. You also um, created a Tribal Sovereignty Institute, and then there uh, was recently a, a grant from the Mellon Foundation to do some more work on behalf of tribes with the university. So 
Um, there's a lot going on there. And, and in between all that, you took a, an advisory position um, to the president. So I think we should try to yeah. touch a little bit on, on some of those. So, yeah, the, the Tribal Sovereignty Institute, which I think, you know, we could do a lot more with. And I, um, but um, what we started doing was offering certificates with that program. And I, Linda Aiken was a friend of mine, still is a friend of mine who works at MnDOT. She's about to retire, which uh, she's going to be sorely missed because for years she kept telling her boss, the, the uh, commissioner and commissioners kept changing in, in MnDOT and Minnesota Department of Transportation that there needs to be classes on um, tribal state relations. And so um, she called me up and she called a bunch of universities and I was the only one who showed up. Um, and um, she wanted to develop courses on tribal state relations. And so, um, but I used to do that anyway, like at Verma Plant at the Department of Human Services and um, Jackie Dion at the Department of Health would call me up and they were just friends of mine that worked for the state that were Native Americans and they'd go, can you go through the history from Columbus down to self-determination for, for this group of people? And I just do it for nothing because I thought it was part of my job as a tribal attorney and then um, uh, then I, you know, Vern and, and, and Linda and all these people that worked for the state that were members of Indian tribes called me up and we all sat down and, and um, um, we were talking about what a course like this could look like. And I'm, I'm kind of like, um, you know, when it comes to, <laughs> I know the subject matter. So I said, let's just do it. Let's just jump into the deep end and um, let's, I'll put together a course. So I put together a one credit program, which is 15 hours at the university of Minnesota and nobody signed up for credit. But we also made it eligible for a certificate through the uh, continuing education program at UMD. And 46 state people showed up. So um, for, for so I started with my lecture of, you know, taking them from papal bulls to the doctrine of discovery to, you know, all this, the early history of colonization and the early part of the United States. And I got into some of the history of the 19th and 20th century and just touched on a few things. And Janice Bad Moccasin, uh, Vern interrupted me and said, Janice wants to say something. And I was like, sure, tribal elder wants to say something. So she got up and stood there and said, these policies that Tad is talking about, allotments and um, assimilation and boarding schools and removal from, you know, and, and relocating people into cities, all of this happened to me and my family and my people. And um, anyway, and, you know, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And then I went back in the corner with Vern and said, what the heck do we do now? And then Linda came back and she said, they want to hear our personal stories. And I was like, oh, OK. Uh, so they don't want to listen to 15 hours of me talking about history. And she was like, uh, not necessarily. So um Anyway, hi, Toby. Um, this, is, this is my puppy who started off. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, good boy. <laughs> um, so we changed it, and we discovered quickly that we had to reach people's. And now he's got a squeaky <laughs> toy, which is not. Um, hey, dogs, they're just so, like kids. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, he's like instant happy to me. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, um, so we spent, we, we did that uh, trial run and then I put all 46 people into a big circle and said, okay, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? And, um, and a bunch of people took notes and then we developed uh, the training out, out of that. And it ended up, I did some of the training, but we needed like an MC and that's what at first, Ed Minima did, and then later, uh, Joseph does now, kind of coordinates the whole thing. And we decided we wanted to do every training on an Indian reservation because we wanted to give them a flavor for what um, a reservation was like. And so we wanted to make sure that we opened with an invocation by a spiritual leader. We taught if we were on a Dakota reservation, we wanted to make sure that they were taught some of the language. If we were on an Ojibwe reservation, um, some of their language, we would 
you know, do lighthearted things that would that with a very heavy handed purpose of we would negotiate a treaty with them, but in Dakota or in Ojibwe, and then, you know, tell them, you know, you just gave up the right to leave the room for a year or something. And anyway, but and then, you know, we show we, we, we worked it up to, to the point where um, it became, a, you know, we would change it up every once in a while, but we would make sure that. Um, we touch their hearts and their heads, and uh, I discovered I don't touch their their hearts. I just I kind of go through the history, and I'm I'm kind of like, but when people get up and start talking about their boarding school experiences, and we used to have a um, a survivor of a boarding school in Alaska come and talk, and I mean there were a lot of very macho guys like. Uh, my friend Ed Fairbanks could not sit through it because he found it so, so compelling, so moving, so, so um, stirring. You know, a lot of a lot of the work we're doing stems from things that are going on across Indian country, you know, as inspiration from things like the MTAG program, from the Reclaiming Native Truth research uh, just kind of this movement of, of narrative change. And I think it's so important that we bring people together to talk about ways we can improve relationships, ways we can help each other out. And I think the university system here in Minnesota, it can be a big player in that space if they choose to, like you say, do the right thing uh, when it comes to tribes and help further tribal initiatives, help educate tribal people, so that they can go back and move their communities forward. So we we definitely appreciate the work you're doing there. Um, I think we need somebody to make good trouble, right? Because uh, I think that's what that's you're right. doing. And um, you know, thank you so much for sharing all your stories and knowledge and experiences with us today. Uh, we could probably visit for for much longer, and we might have to get you back on here one of these days. Uh, but we so appreciate you coming on today. Well, Chimi Gretsch and Pitamea, and thank you for all you do. And uh, um, I wish you all the best with your podcast. I think it's going to be great. Thanks so much, Tad. You have a great day. Thank you for joining me for the Native Minnesota podcast. For more episodes, please subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can also visit our website, understandnativemn.org, to learn more about our campaign's work to improve the Native narrative in Minnesota's public schools.